uh, what I want to talk about today, it's kind of, um, well, it's basically um, some of the techniques that I've been using in my, in my research. Um, so what I am trying to compute is, so formally it's called the NNLO connections to T-channel single top work production. Um, that's very fancy for basically, we want a consistent calculation up to second order in perturbation theory. What we're basically calculating is um, up and bottom goes to down and top through the T-channel. And we basically want to compute, uh, the, uh, compute this matrix element and then uh, integrate it to find your uh, the differential cross. We want to find the cross section basically. But the main challenge is computing the matrix element. And the reason that becomes a very big challenge here is because we have to compute loop integrals. And loop integrals are just extremely messy and hard to do because, um, well, for multiple reasons, like uh, you, you, sometimes you get hypergeometric functions, sometimes you get confluent hypergeometric functions. A lot of the integrals themselves are inherently divergent. So you have to be very, very careful about how you do things because um, you will have one over epsilon as epsilon goes to zero kind of poles showing up everywhere. So the way you define your diagram, the way you do your algebra, like you have to be very, very accurate and careful because, um, because there's only one way that each of these one of divergences in the integrals cancel out. And you have to be very careful because again, one of the things about QFT that makes it really subtle and so strong and amazing and so powerful, sorry, is the fact that like, even though QFT has these inherent divergences, any observable that you calculate just works out such such elegantly that all the divergences cancel out. That's what that that's what makes QFT so powerful, and that is exactly what makes this computation so challenging. Okay, so first of all, how do you compute a matrix element in um, QFT? So this is a very very simple QED process that you can see on the screen. E plus e minus to mu plus mu minus. This is a very basic three-level amplitude that you want to calculate in QED. Now, how you go about it is like, you write down the matrix element, which looks like this. And this you get from basically using the diagrams. How you read these diagrams is like, okay, so first we have V bar two gamma mu rho of P one. So the reason I'm using V bar is because it is an incoming antiparticle, my positron. Using U, U describes particles uh, and in this case, my electron is coming in. Okay, now why does this look like V bar gamma mu U of P1? That comes, um, and then it's, and if you will notice that you have E plus, E minus connected to a photon. QED vertex. So if you take your QED Lagrangian, you take the interaction term in the Lagrangian, and then you convert it into momentum space, this is the expression that you will get for this E plus, E minus goes to uh, gamma vertex. And what happens on the other end is that the gamma connects to a mu plus mu minus, which is, you can kind of think of like a conjugate or whatever happened initially. And that is basically all the information I've written down. This is, this is the incoming particles. These are the outgoing particles. This thing in the middle, propagator. These, um, so propagator, as the name suggests, is basically like um, how, like it's kind of like a two-point correlator for any function that you have of two-point correlators within your theory. So that's basically what I have. Now the thing is, I want to solve this. Now, first of all, writing down a matrix element does nothing. You have no information at all. The object that you actually want to compute is the matrix element squared. Because like this, and this is kind of like motivated by typical stuff you do in quantum mechanics and blah, 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 where like, like matrix elements never really tell you anything. You have to square it to get any observable value out of it. and with that in mind, that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so then uh, when you, so M squared here will be M dagger F. Oh wait, sorry, just to clarify, what I've written down is I times the matrix L. And what we want next is M dagger F. So again, if you appropriately do stuff, this is the expression you'll get. And what you're gonna notice is that you're gonna have this entire thing that's complex conjugated, multiplied by a thing that is wrong. And that's a typo here, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Now, one thing to notice is that you have V bar P2 gamma mu U of P1, um, and this is um, starred, but this, uh, this, there's another thing, right? Um, you have which multiplies um, V bar P2 U of P1, right? What is that you have U of P1 here and U of P1 here, and this has a, and this has a dagger and this doesn't. So when you write things out, what you will notice is that all the indices turn out to be cyclic. And this is exactly 
exactly what Casimi noticed, and this is basically what is known as Casimi strip, where like when you square a matrix element, um, you're going to have two copies of this thing, this and this complex conjugate, and two copies of this thing and its complex conjugate. And then if you're very careful about how you write down the indices, they become cyclic, and that allows you to convert that expression into a trace. And traces are much easier to compute than any sort of matrix um, matrix manipulations. And the other thing that makes traces a lot easier is that traces then become just numbers. And it's significantly easier to deal with just numbers than it is to deal with complicated spinner structures. Um, so then now like how you get from here to here is just using Dirac equations and some simple trace, not even trace identities, some like gamma matrix identities. And I kind of don't want to delve into that. You can look at that up in any particle physics book. That's at this point, just a matter of mathematical manipulation. There's really not much deep physics going on. And you just keep contracting stuff. You do blah, 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 and you get to this expression. This is basically what that looks like. This is the matrix element squared. What you do after this is you take this matrix element squared, you integrate it over phase space, and you get your cross section. And you're basically done. Now, this is fine and good within the context for a tree level diagram. They're really easy to compute. We're done. The issue is um, that, like, say, instead of this, uh, now, okay, so I'm going to switch to um, the lecture notes on wealth and possibility reduction, which is basically the bulk of what I want to talk about. And this is from a lecturer at Southampton. So um, I don't remember, I don't know who exactly it is, but they teach at Southampton University. But like, and the key idea is that like, when you have diagrams like this, which have loop, things get significantly more complicated because you have to integrate over your propagators. And the reason you do this, or rather like the very hand wavy way that I can make it make sense to me and is that um, in the path integral formalism for QFT, uh, the way you look at things is that all different possible paths are possible. I mean, sorry, wait, that was a redundant statement. All different possible paths occur, but with different probabilities. And that is kind of the idea here is that like, uh, because when you write down a matrix element like this, and you want momenta to be like, you want to accurately define how the momenta flow through this entire thing, what you will notice is that like you very appropriately tag on some undetermined momentum, which is just flowing around the loop, that still gives you something that's consistent. And you have to do that because you have to account for every single possible momentum flow that you can have, because that is what your path integral for QFT is telling you. And then once you have L, now since L, which is the loop momentum, is something that there is no way you can observe. And because it's completely undetermined, there is no way we can put any sort of constraints on what values it must take. It can take any value from zero all the way up to infinity. And that is why we have to integrate over that undetermined loop momenta over, uh, over all the propagators. Now, this is something that is objectively really hard to solve. Because um, and, like, even if there is nothing, even if there's just thing, like, even there's just like a one in the numerator, and for a denominator like this, of itself is incredibly hard to solve. First of all, because some of them in regular four-dimensional space them are divergent. And this you can see in any typical QFT textbook when they're talking about particle amplitudes and blah, blah, blah. So I don't want to go too, in, too deep into that. But the thing is how you go about avoiding the divergence is now you go into D dimensions, which is why you'll notice that this is set up as a D dimensional integral. It makes things much harder because like when you start dealing with higher higher dimensional spaces, things get super funky. And also, um, when you do go to higher dimensional space, um, the, these, in, like, these integrals just like become more complicated. And um, so you get like confluent hypergeometric functions, hypergeometric functions, and a lot of stuff that can come up. Now, the thing is, we can at least have some idea on how to solve the scalar integrals. Scalar integrals are the one for which we just have a one in the numerator. Um, and at least if worst comes to worst, scalar integrals can at least be numerically estimated. But turns out that like when you write down propagators, right? Like, okay, we saw that the photon propagator was just a G mu nu. That is fine. Like the QCD, for QCD, the gluon propagator, that is still like a G mu nu with some color indices, perfectly fine. But then when we go into the weak sector, when we have these massive bosons, it's not just G mu nu, it's G mu nu minus P mu P nu divided by P squared. 
And we cannot ignore that PMUP new term because like the reason we can ignore that in QCD and QED is because that is just um, the choice of gauge you make because you have an underlying symmetry that is still valid. But because in the electroweak sector, you get massive bosons because of an explicit breaking of a symmetry, you cannot impose gauge redundant, you cannot impose a gauge condition to get rid of that additional term in the uh, boson propagator. So when you include, when you have a process with a weak boson being exchanged, your numerator will have indices. And that's gonna make this a significantly harder problem to solve. And because the calculation I am doing is effectively a weak process with strong corrections, my propagators will have uh, uncontracted indices or rather will have indices in the numerator. And then one of the major technical challenges was to figure out how to solve those integrals. But fortunately, this was done in the 60s uh, by, Toft and Welt by Toft, Weltman and Passerino. Um, or rather, it was figured out by Weltman and Passerino, a general strategy on how to do this. And then Toft and Weltman used it in their very famous paper to show like basically the entire one loop structure of QED, um, where they were calculating loop corrections to muons. It's a really, it's a really, really long and mathematically formal paper. And like, it's, it's an incredible paper basically. Anyway, so what I want to broadly do today, or rather I'm going to spend the bulk of today, is basically just talking about how this entire procedure works. How do you get these weird integrals with indices and then how you reduce them to scalar integrals. Um, and then once I'm done talking about that, if we have enough time, I'm just gonna like briefly mention some other challenges that I faced and then maybe talk about those in the next, next time when I'm leading a discussion. Okay, so um, let's just take a look at this thing and get the notation out of the way. So first of all, we only want to look at the loop integrals. So I really don't care about what the, any of the external particles are. All I really care about are the propagators. And also of all the propagators, I only care about the ones in which the propagator has an L because they're the only ones that will be contributing to the integral. Okay, so um, we have L squared minus M zero squared to correspond to this propagator down here. Can you guys see the thing, the cursor? Okay, so we have um, this thing. Okay, which is, which is saying that that propagator is a mass M0. Then the next thing is when we go down here, we have a contribution P1. And we're calling this L plus Q1 because we're defining Q1 in such a way that like, um, basically it just keeps adding on the next momentum. This, again, this seems like redundant way of just redefining things, but this is going to become really helpful in the future. So we have L plus Q1, which is basically L plus P1 from this definition. Q1 will just be P1. So once P2 comes in, it will be L plus Q2, which now will become Q1, P1 plus P2. And then blah, 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 all the way through here and here. And then uh, once we come back to Pn, we'll go back to having L. Then that should be pretty obvious at this point. Right? Because like, um, because what happens is like, when you have, when you come here, you'll have basically um, Qn minus one, which will be the summation of one n minus one. But then like once you impose momentum conservation, like the sum for of momentum from one to, to Pn minus one should be Pn. That is basically momentum conservation being imposed. So you can go back to L. And for the sake of generality, each of them are given uh, different masses. Um, Cause like in general, like, okay, there, there are cases when you can have like propagators with four different masses, but like, they are they are crazy and you kind of can always get away with an approximation setting sum to zero. But if, if you want to solve this in the most general case, you, you want to have n different masses. Um, also, a small caveat here is that the dimension over which we're integrating is set to four minus two epsilon. Okay, the reason we want to go in an even dimension is slightly technical and it's because of the Clifford algebra. The Clifford algebra of the, which is the algebra of the gamma matrices is well defined in even dimensions, which is why when we want to even do this very weird dimensional regularization thing, just to be ex careful and very accurate, you have to set it to four minus two epsilon. Um, so, okay, now with that done. Uh, um, but why, yeah. uh, why, why is the, uh, is there any reason particularly why you have a, a four minus two epsilon there? like? something to do with the integral maybe when you're calculating it 
that is the idea of dimensional regularization right because like if something is diverging because a lot of these loop integrals that you compute even if you just do it in d equals 4 you will yeah. get something that's unbounded right yeah it'll go yeah. as lambda to the fourth and blah blah okay blah, blah, you're blah. doing some dimensional regularization yeah yeah basically dimensional okay. regularization right? okay um and in fact it's because of this epsilon only that like epsilon poles come up in your integrals right and the, anyway yeah okay so okay again when well, if you said f l equals 1 you get what is called a scalar integral if you um, if f l is like like okay this for instance is a scalar integral and um, also to go back and just take a slightly more careful look at the notation it's called i sub n here because you have n different propagators in the denominator and that should make sense you're going 1 2 3 blah 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 all the way up to and then we're going to define this integral and the reason for this definition will become clearer later on but we're calling this i n minus 1 j what this means is that like instead of having propagators in the denominator we now have minus 1 propagators in the denominator and the one propagator that is pinched out is the one which has the jth mass and qj momentum this is just the definition you notice that here that we have l plus qj minus 1 minus n j minus 1 squared just the indices here and here we have j plus 1 basically the propagator which has which is l plus q j squared minus mj squared is not a part of this integral that's all this notation is telling all right and basically corresponds to a diagram that is like this um again like don't don't try to give this to a significance now this is just something we'll need as an intermediate step in the future And then similarly, you can define some this i n minus two j one j two, but this means you have n minus two propagators, and the propagators that you have pinched out are the one is the one that corresponds to the j uh, j one q j one and q j two. Okay. So scalar integrals can't be made simple. There's nothing you can do with it. So the simplest case that we can deal with is when we have one index in the momentum. So that now our integral looks something like this. Now the thing is, just by looking at this integral itself, there is nothing you can do about it. There seems no objective way to make it simpler. There's the uh, and it just looks like it's a mess that you have to somehow deal with. However, this is where a very very subtle argument comes in. And are you? I'm assuming you're familiar with the idea of form factors in QE, and this is the exact same idea. is that you do some sort of a form factor expansion here except you're expanding in terms of p1 mu p2 mu p3 mu blah 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 blah, blah. now because you have n momenta right but in order to define the n because you're imposing conservation of momentum all you need to do is you have you need to have uniquely defined n minus 1 momenta because then momentum conservation will fix pn right so when you're expanding you don't expand in terms of all the n free momenta of the particles that are coming in and going out you just need the n minus 1 momenta and the reason you choose momenta is because these are the only objects right now that give you an uncontracted lorentz index because your entire integral has an uncontracted lorentz index so you want to expand it out in terms of every single linearly independent object that can have one uncontracted lorentz index So that's why I can expand it out in terms of some a bunch of coefficients and p mu's. So now this is incredible. This is incredible. What we've basically done is I have basically reduced this now to a linear algebra problem, and the problem is just computing the coefficient c n. That's all you really have to do now. Um, so then, um, what you do then is that. Um, Basically, you contract it with any of the independent momenta you're using in the expansion. This is the delta i j, which is the gram matrix, which is basically p i dot p j, where p i is here, right? Okay. Now, when you have l dot p j and all of this, like this is still not helping you because this is still not a scalar integral that you solve. However, you can do something a little bit clever here. That is this bit of algebra right down here. Okay, now 
I'm going to let you convince yourself here that this is true. I'm, this is some very, very simple algebra. But basically, here, let's take a look at this term first of all. Okay. This term is the gth propagator. Right? This term is the j minus 1th propagator. This is just some value in the numerator. Does this make sense? So when I put this entire thing in the numerator, and this is basically an expansion for n dot pj. When I put this in the numerator, what happens is now instead of one integral, I will have three integrals, and each of these three will be scalar integrals. If I just take this, I get an integral without the jth propagator. If I just take this, I will get an integral without the j minus one propagator. And I, if I take this, I will just get a scalar integral with all the propagators in time, right? So, and this is good because now what I'm doing is that I don't have any weird integral. All of them are scalar integrals, which in principle we can solve. Either we have a closed form solution or we can do some sort of numerical estimate based on which regime we are wanting to do our computation in. And then we are done. But the other thing we have to be care of, we have to take care of, is that in order to do this, Note that we had to do a contraction between P1 and Pj, right? And of this, we have to be very careful because this is again, uh, this is called the Gram matrix, invert it, right? And, I'm sorry, we're going to need to invert it to find the coefficients. Because like, oh, if, I, if I have this thing, right? If I multiply the left and right by delta ij inverse, that's basically how I solve for these coefficients. In order to do that, my gram matrix must be invertible, which then raises the question, am I guaranteed to always have a gram matrix that is invertible? And the answer to that question is not always, because the way I'm defining the gram matrix is pi dot pj. So if I were to have some momenta that go collinear, then these dot products will start vanishing which is going to give me a bunch of zeros in this matrix, which is most likely going to lead to the matrix being non-invertible. So it turns out when you're defining your gram matrix, you have to be careful about the combination of momenta you're choosing. If you have, and uh, you have to be careful about the combination of momenta you're choosing. That's basically the thing. And if they are, if there's no way you can define like a nice basis, then this approach will basically not work. So the, so this is one of the key ingredients that you have to be really, really careful about when you're choosing the momentum of your incoming and outgoing particle is that they have to be linearly independent and it should not be collinear uh, because that can really, really mess things up for you. Okay. So once we have done, basically, this is basically what I said earlier about like having a denominator, having, having an integral, which is scalar with N minus one dip propagators with the Jth one removed. Then the same thing with the j minus one through one removed, and then you just have this entire scalar propagator. Sorry, this entire scalar integral with this coefficient, and you calculate, and then you get that the, each of these values of these coefficients, basically when you multiply both of these integrals with the inverse of um, your gram matrix, basically. So, yeah, that's basically it, and now we are done, right? And that's all we care about. We want to compute these coefficients. So the next thing is, so what follows is just an explicit calculation. And I really don't want to go into this because like you can just look at it and that's kind of enough and you'll be done, right? I, uh, and it's not something I want to go over in detail. Let's, let's just say it's an exercise for close reading. The best part about this is like, this is a solved example kind of. So like you can always sit through it yourself. Okay, so that's basically all I had for the entire Pasarino wealth introduction. Um, now, if I go back to this. so okay, so basically what happened is now we have a way of tackling uh, loop integrals, right? But then there is still in order to solve the loop integrals, we're actually introducing another problem here. If you think about it, what we had to do to solve the loop integrals is that we had, we had to depart from four dimensional space time to D equals four minus two epsilon dimensional space time. And when we're doing that, we have to be really, really careful because it's not just the integral, it's the momenta two that transformed. 
and when you and here's the thing a matrix element is not going to have uncontract or rather when you square the matrix element you're going to be sla- you're going to like have a lot of products between gamma matrices and your momenta right and a lot of the momenta that appear within um like in a propagator too will be like will be from like a fermion propagator right because a fermion propagator would have p slash something in the numerator right so which means you have gamma mu p nu but then when you're putting your p nu into your integral your p nu is now not a four dimensional object anymore which means to make your entire thing consistent your gamma also cannot be a four dimensional object anymore it has to now become a four minus two dimensional object and this again opens an entire new can of worms because now what happens is like your your algebra for gamma matrices is not closed in higher dimensions your gamma fives become very ill defined your traces lose their cyclicity and a lot of messy 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 things happen right so then the question is how do we go about tackling this and it turns out that there is a very subtle way to be doing that okay could you stop sharing here for one second wait so uh, when yeah. yeah when gamma 5 itself is uh, yeah. becomes slightly ill defined or uh, yeah. we can't even bring in like the the modified u1 symmetry into picture as well right you go gamma no. 5 is not related to u1 symmetry no like this like the, you have this e power minus i gamma 5 alpha ah that that's chiral symmetry it, chiral symmetry yeah. right so that also okay. you can't bring into picture here and you bringing up a really valid point right mm-hmm. now hear me out when you're dealing with massless particles right one of the techniques you could use to solve this entire problem is spiller helicity formalism right that makes computations of massless matrix elements much easier and that fails you and that fails you precisely because when you want to do spinner helicity formalism it relies on a factorization of your spinners based of chiralities mm-hmm. but because your gamma five is not well defined because your chirality is not does not become a very very well defined quantity here that is not how you talk about this thing and that becomes a really really important thing to care about because that severely restricts a lot of techniques you can use because a lot of techniques that have been developed to handle um, matrix manipulations or like the manipulation of gamma matrices have been developed in four dimensions there is no nice way to extend them to higher dimensions so you are exactly right and moreover because there are like uh, the gamma matrices don't form a closed algebra anymore the one of the ways we define gamma matrix in four dimensions is like some negative i over something gamma 0 gamma 1 gamma 2 gamma 3 But then that doesn't work here. So then you have to choose what property of your gamma five you want. Do you want it to be anti-commuting, or do you want it to be doing any of the other things that the gamma five does? So then this becomes a scheme-dependent calculation. But then again, because your thing is an ob- observable at the end, you're computing an observable matrix element. It doesn't matter which scheme you're using, which again boils down, which which again severely restricts which schemes are good schemes to use generally. and that's kind of what i want to go into just right after this so yeah rahul could you stop sharing for one second okay so now coming back to the question that we were just talking about about how um the fact that gamma 5 is not well defined becomes a problem in higher dimensions and how spinners spinner structures and blah blah, blah do become a problem in higher dimensions there is a very sly and a very subtle way of dealing with this and that was introduced quite recently in in like may around may 2021 in this paper by Tiziano Pereira and Lorenzo Tancredi uh Lorenzo I cannot pronounce his last name so I'm not even going to bother trying so basically what they have done in this paper is they have provided a uh, provided a proof that irrespective of what you are doing the only part of the spinner structures and the gamma matrices that ma- gamma matrices that matter to your c- calculation is like what happens when you project them down into four space and dimensions the idea is when you're extending these you're going to like into a more general set of gamma matrices the only thing that matters is the bit of those that ex- work, like, that exist in four space and dimensions when you project down and um the kind of in the appendix of the paper it's been quite some time since i've gone over this proof so i'm hoping i can still remember it but let's see i want to briefly go over this proof because it's really really subtle and it's it, it's actually and it's also really powerful um at the same time okay um all right 
So this is um, this is a typical spinner chain that exists. A matrix element, an arbitrary matrix element, in your most general matrix element. This is basically what, what a spinner chain will look like. And without loss of generality, I can choose U bar and U. It uh, doesn't matter which one they choose because, excuse me, that that's really not that that bad. You, you can easily like put any of the other ones there, and the arguments here will still. All right. Because we are in um, d-dimensional space, this uh, the we now have a, a Lorentz ind indices are um, d-dimensional, and this is the algebra that we're going to be. Um, this is the algebra that defines the matrix, and this is your typical um, Clifford algebra, except now we're doing it in d-dimensional space time. And the G mu nu here is a d-dimensional matrix matrix structure. Now the key idea here. That any gamma mu that I write can be expanded out in this form, where I have it in four dimensions and the neg extra negative minus two epsilon dimension. Every single gamma matrix I can write down this way, right? And then here is the really key part: the bit that is in four dimensions and the bit that is in minus two epsilon dimensions. These do not interact with each other. They cannot communicate with each other in any way, shape, or form. And this comes down to the very subtle physics argument that we started with. That is, any observable object that we want to deal with can only have the four-dimensional space-time dependence. Whatever happens in the extra minus two space-time depend minus two epsilon dimensions cannot have any observable impact on our four dimensions of space-time. Right? Which then now allows me to write down this entire basis in this fashion, where all have uh, this looks slightly weird, but all has been done here. You have you see so started off with these n gamma matrices. Now each of these n gamma matrices you're writing as gamma mu gamma nu, and then what you're doing here is that you're pulling all the bits that is uh, minus two epsilon to the left here, and all the four dimensional bits to the right. Again, this is what typical terms. Uh, so it'll be like a linear combination of such terms. If you have one term which just has the minus epsilon terms, you'll have one term that is just the four gamma terms. I mean, the four dimensional gamma mu's. Every single other one is going to be a um, combination of minus two epsilon and four. And this is because, like, you basically have n of these n terms multiplying each other. So you'll have a bunch of terms like this. Okay. Now. Um, this also leads us to another really subtle thing, is that because the four-dimensional space-time has to be decoupled from the minus two epsilon dimension space-time, my gamma mu nu will basically have a block structure in four space-time dimensions and a block structure in the remaining minus two epsilon dimensions, which then in fact allows me to write um, these gamma mu one blah 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 mu n one in the minus two epsilon dimensions. As some arbitrary tensor times um, u bar p1, just the four dimensional gammas and up2. Now, this tensor, because it is based on the Lorentz indices in the minus two epsilon bit of your gamma matrix, can only depend on the g mu nu, which is defining the minus two epsilon dimensions. And now, uh, when we control any of this kind of structure with any four dimensional vector, these bits just vanish because they cannot interact with four dimensional vectors. So their dependence is just gone. And this, what this tells you is that when you have your four dimensional Lorentz algebra, and in order to dimensionally regularize, dimensionally regularize your integral, you're putting everything in d minus two epsilon dimensions that doesn't really matter at all in terms of what you observe, because at the end of the day, it's only the four dimensional part that contributes to anything observable. The rest of it does not, and they will vanish out. And this is kind of how you go about showing that. So yeah, so this is basically like just a brief summary of how I've gone about trying to tackle integrals with the context of like the research that I'm doing. Um, of course, there are, and again, one thing to notice is that Pasolino Weltman reduction uh, that I spoke about is valid for only when there's like one undetermined momentum in the loop. But like if you have two loops which have like 
one fermion line in common like basically for some something like nested loops that makes it much harder because now like you'll have to integrate over two unknown momenta and um, for that use things like laporta algorithm and whatever which i know just exists but i don't have a detailed understanding of because that's not something i have uh, that's not something that's basically the next step of my research project so as of right now we're trying to deal with the one loop um, integrals uh, figure out this four dimensional space and dependence and just solve all of that in one go and that's kind of where we are and um i think uh, yeah that kind of wraps up everything i wanted to talk about today do you guys have any questions mm, not in particular uh, i'm just uh, thinking about how the algebra of the gamma matrices would look like in uh, minus two e, not two epsilon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, in respect of what they look like, we don't. It 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 since it doesn't have any mm. um, because it's going to cancel off when it's contracted with the four dimensional tensor, which is what we get like after four dimensional vector right. so after we do the integration, it completely right. vanishes out. So the structure of its algebra doesn't bother us at all. But I'm sure there's a way of finding it out. I mean, like, it's going to be something super tricky, though. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we do not need to know its explicit structure in order to just get rid of, fortunately right. for us. Right. Yeah, the argument seems consistent. It is. And, that, um, yeah. it, it takes you some time to actually completely internalize it, right? Because I've yeah. kind of been like trying to figure out this paper since like I, so my advisor gave it to me in around June to read, to actually understand this. And to be very honest, it did not consistently make sense to me until like a month ago. Yeah. Um, Cause this argument here is really, really subtle and it all hinges on the fact that because you're dealing with something that's a physical observable, you're four, even though you're extending the gamma matrix, you can write it out as something like four and minus two epsilon bits. And the bits that are four and the bits that are minus two epsilon do not interact with each other. And the bits that are minus two epsilon, since they cannot have an observable index, observable, um, cannot have an observable effect, they will cancel out when contracted with something that is observable. And what basically that does is like every single term that has this minus two epsilon dependence that will have such a tensor, right? And this tensor will always cancel out when multiplied by a four dimensional thing. So all that you will have left thing that cannot have any minus two epsilon. And that is precisely the four dimensional spinner structure that you started off with. Mm. So basically yes, what happened, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no, go ahead. So yeah, no, that, that's, that's it really. Like you get, like mm. you start with something that's simple, but when you go to higher dimensions, it, it becomes something simple plus a lot of complicated things. And then all those complicated things actually go to zero when you do the contraction in the final step of your calculation. You got it. Okay. Yeah, I still have to think about the anti-commutation relation there, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. sounds good. Okay. Uh, also, the anti-commutation relation for, at least, okay, not for this thing, but for gamma 5 at least, mm -hmm. is imposed by hand. Uh, that is mm -hmm. one of the conventions. That is one of the conventions called the anti-commuting gamma 5 thing, which is what we think we're going to use for calculation, but I don't know yet. But the idea is like gamma 5 has many different properties which you can pick and choose. One of the properties is that it, it allows you to define, it allows you to define your projection operators, right? And the other okay. thing is it is anti-commutes with every other gamma matrix. So then there are two ways of going about this within the context of a calculation. Um, and at that point, you would choose which is more relevant to yours. Do you want to explicitly work with projections or spinners? If yes, then you use your gamma five in terms of your projection operators. But on the other hand, if you want to deal with a lot of traces and a lot of complicated structures, having an anti-commuting gamma five makes that those calculations easier. So because that is what we are most likely, that's what we're doing right now we're most likely going to go down the route of being like, okay, the way I'm defining my higher dimensional gamma five is to be inherently anti-commuting. I guess we can stop here. <laughs>